Good afternoon and welcome to our session today. CASA, Child, Adolescent and Family Mental Health, is extremely proud to take on a leadership role with our partners, Edmonton Public Schools, the Alliance on Mental Health and Mental Illness, the Institute of Health Economics, and the University of Alberta in, taking, in talking about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on mental health. Before we begin, I want to uh, acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 uh, territory. It's a traditional meeting ground um, and a gathering place. And so uh, we want to uh, mention uh, the Cree, the Soti, the Blackfoot, Métis, uh, the Dene, and the Nakota uh, Sioux. Today, we are in an unprecedented change of time mm -hmm. in which it's certainly an understatement to all of us in dealing with this uncertainty and trying to understand what's going on in the world. The outbreak of COVID-19 has caused a lot of fear, anxiety, confusion, and we want to try and normalize that to the, to the best of our ability. We all feel overwhelmed, so we want to take the opportunity through these uh, sessions to do that with everybody and to kind of reduce the stress. Uh, CASA wants to provide accurate and trusted information as to what uh, our expertise is and share that with you in this changing environment. I'd like to introduce Leslie McDonald, who is the moderator for this session. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Leslie. Thanks so much. And that's Dr. Denise Milne. She is the CEO of CASA. And, uh, and it's incredible that Denise has worked so quickly to make this happen. Um, I'm going to, uh, first of all, sort of set this up and give you an idea of what our format's going to be like today. Uh, we, have, um, we have a wonderful gentleman joining us shortly uh, who's going to, we're going to sort of have a discussion about the overview about trauma and uh, about some of the things that people are going through and what we can do to help you cope with these things. Uh, and then we're going to open it up so that you can ask your questions as well. Uh, we are here at the CASA Centre Resource Community Centre uh, in the CASA Centre in the, on the south side. Um, and uh, a lot of conflicting information out there um, and um, a lot to deal with, a lot to take in and, uh, and we want to help people to look at how you can take care of yourself. The impact is huge. It's different for different people and different groups of people. Um, this is a really traumatizing time, as Denise mentioned, for adults, um, uh, but in particular for adults who already had, uh, you know, issues dealing with mental health. Um, we just want you to know that with CASA, that we have the resources, that, that, that there are people out there who care about you and care about the information that you're getting and, uh, and want to try as much as possible to help you maintain uh, good health in, uh, in these difficult times. Um, we have a Roger Bland lecture series um, that we started two years ago and it is based on opening up the dialogue um, so that, uh, you know, we, we need to talk about mental health issues in order to get healthy and to keep the stigma from happening. And, and so we're continuing that open dialogue uh, with this web-based series. So we are very, very pleased um, to have as our first guest today uh, joining us. Uh, he's a noted Canadian child psychiatrist, Dr. Andrew Bremness. Uh, he's a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Division of Child Psychiatry at the University of Alberta. He's also a consulting psychiatrist in the Child Health Unit at the Misericordia Hospital, but he's probably best known for his work with CASA's trauma program and the Trauma and Attachment Group, otherwise known as TAG. Oh, we are so happy to have you here because you have such a wealth of information in this area. And, uh, and so pleased to have you share it. And we're hoping we can at least get through some of it because I Good. know there's so much in that brain of yours. Um, first of all, we, have, um, we are six feet apart yep. uh, in keeping with, uh, Practicing with the distancing our social rule. distance. Exactly. Uh, it's hard for me because I'm a maritimer, so I want to <laughs> <laughs> reach out and lean in. Um, so let's first of all talk about trauma. This is certainly a traumatizing time for people, but is it? Is it diagnosed? Is it trauma? Are people actually dealing with trauma over this? Trauma is defined as anything that threatens the core of our existence, the core of our being, our central safety. So COVID-19, mostly because it's getting uh, to be the only thing we talk about, 
is threatening the core of our existence. It's changing all of our daily routines, all of our sense of ourselves, and it, although most people will only get mildly or maybe moderately ill with it, it can kill people. So it's a bit of the boogeyman that can come out of the dark and literally kind of kill us, right? I think there's an ancient fear in humanity about plagues. Oh, interesting. You know, so, yeah. and we know that transgenerational trauma is passed in our genes. So there is an ancient fear of uh, plagues coming and wiping out some of the population. So, yes, this is a, a trauma of sorts on different levels from mm -hmm. the kids being home from school and what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. And how can I take care of my kids properly through to who do I know that I love could get killed by this? Wow. And then, of course, there's so many different layers to this one in particular because of how it affects people financially and, uh, and people who are shut-ins, maybe, who are single. And, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just uh, the economic implications right. alone are... Well, so the finances affect the core of our safety. Mm -hmm. Can I supply for my loved ones? Yeah. You know, and if I can't, then all the trauma parts of our brain get activated. Let's talk about that. Okay. So what happens in the brain during trauma? Well, we all have what we would loosely call trauma tracks. They're built in mm -hmm. so that when something, you know, if there's a grizzly bear standing in front of you, you're not supposed to use your higher thinking centers. You're supposed to use your sensory motor activities and get the heck out, mm -hmm. right? So you're not killed by the grizzly bear. So our trauma tracks invite impulsive um, doing. So hence all the toilet paper is gone from the shelves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but in the middle of trauma, um, we have ways of saying, okay, besides the panic of it, how can we calm the panic so we can problem solve through this uh, endeavor we got to do together, right? right? And somehow accentuate the, maybe the, the, uh, the, a good side of this or the silver lining of this of literally we are coming together. Whatever you think about other things in life, it brings us together. And so that's the, that's the silver lining in all this, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to begin with um, attachment. And attachment is, you know, beginning with a newborn in mom's arms. Mm -hmm. And the newborn knows it's safe through attachment with the maternal figure, and it could be a dad, but with the central attachment figure, mm -hmm. right? And over time, our attachment gets us through traumatizing events because somewhere deep in our core, we know that someone loves us, someone's gonna supply for us, someone's gonna take care of us, and somehow I'm gonna be okay, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If attachment is challenged at the same time there's trauma, then the trauma doesn't get dealt with as well. So partly what I'd like to talk about today is how we can beef up attachment and we got the perfect setting to do that because we're all home together. And Hopefully, that's where attachment, together. well, um, you know, some of us are still working, obviously here we are, <laughs> CASA, right? Yeah. But if we're home with our kids, especially if there's one or the other parent mm -hmm. home with the kids mm -hmm. or a lovely caregiver like a grandma or an auntie or someone who's home with the kids or a professional caregiver, we can improve attachment and therefore we improve the result of coping with trauma, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you'd like, we could go through some steps of uh, improving trauma, uh, sorry, improving attachment that deals with trauma in some really simple kind of ways. Okay. So I'm going to give you a three-step kind of um, way of looking at any problem that arises in life. And I, I don't want to talk about what everyone else is talking about. Okay, keep your social distance, yes. wash your hands, don't touch your face. We all know that stuff. Mm -hmm. But please do practice it. Um, if What we'd like to stress here at CASA is practice the mental health that you would practice under any other stress. If the pet dog died, if 
you know, if we failed an exam at school, if our parents aren't getting along, if, you know, A, B, C, or D that we would just traditionally see here at CASA, we want to practice that and get past the panic and the, and the, just the frustration of, well, everything's different. I don't know what, what all is going on. It's mm -hmm. such a fluid kind of thing. I, don't, I hear different things from this person or that person. Mm -hmm. And get back to some basics we know we can trust. Mm -hmm. So the first always is, well, self-reflection. What's going on with me or what's going on with my family? And parents can help kids to learn self-reflection. And self-reflection literally means, so how am I doing with this? Mm -hmm. And if you can get to naming a feeling, so how I'm feeling is a small feeling like frustration or a great big feeling like dread or fear or terrible anxiety or a sense of sadness or whatever else might come up. And we want parents to know, we'd like you to listen to your kids' feelings, hear them, don't try and fix them off the bat, hear them, and then go to where your child is. So typically, a busy parent will say, come on, don't feel like that, cheer up, or dad will be home soon, or this virus will be over soon, you know, sort of a desire to fix it, because we want our kids to be happy, we want our kids to feel like we're helping them, right? Rather, we'd like you to let the child express a feeling and then support that by saying, um, I think if I'm observing you carefully, you're feeling pretty shaken by this, or afraid grandma could die from this, or whatever the situation might be, right? Or just I'm bored to tears because I'm not in school and I can't see my friends. But see if you can name the feeling. And that's all self-reflection is. Just acknowledge what is going on with me, right? Now that's what a mom does in, with a newborn baby. Mm -hmm. They acknowledge what's going on. You're hungry, I'll feed you. Mm -hmm. You're in pain, I'll comfort you. You're cold, I'll warm you up. If mm -hmm. you're hot, I'll cool you off. I mean, the baby knows instinctually that mom will know what to do. So in moms and dads, we simply say, go to where your child is and you've got the time now because we're all kind of hunkered down at home. Yep. The good part of this is we're not as busy as we would typically be. Where somewhere in the back of a mother's or father's mind, it's, I, I know you're feeling something, but I don't have time for that because we've got six other things to do before we go to bed tonight so we can get up and just do it all again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We've got the time now. That's the silver lining in this. Mm -hmm. And we can really practice attachment mm -hmm. and remind our kids, we're here to get you through this. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, step one, practice self-reflection. And then, if I can self-reflect and name a feeling, then I can self-regulate that feeling. So then the, the idea is, in a family setting, so if we're feeling bored, how do we manage boredom? If we're feeling afraid, how do we manage fear? If we're feeling sad, how do we manage sadness? And we have to have answers for this. And that's why you come to a place like CASA, you see your therapists or your doctor, and you get these answers of practicing mental health. So the second step here is practicing self-regulation has um, some basic steps to it. And they're literally the, the simplicity of cognitive behavioral therapy, a well-known uh, evidence-based self-regulation science. Mm -hmm. Right? The first one always starts with breathing. Nature gave us an in. Anybody who does yoga knows this for the last 4,000 years. Nature gave us an in to immediately self-regulate, and it's called our breath. Mm -hmm. So if we can slow our breathing from panic or frustration, which is <laughs> to a slow four count in and a slow four count out, and anybody's done yoga or Pilates or whatever knows how to do this. And parents often forget what they know and how they can immediately help their kids. So we practice breathing. And I'd like to suggest that if we have to design new structure and routines 
for our kids during time when they're off school that we build in not only solid structure and routine like we do for the summer holidays. See, the summer holidays we plan for. We know the kids are going to be off for two months, so we plan camps and we plan daily routines and we get them up on time and get to bed on time because kids out of routines are not going to do as well as kids in routine. Mm -hmm. So we plan for ongoing routine and structure and that's part of maintaining mental health. Mm -hmm. It is for adults too. It's just a bit more poignant for kids. In that building in structure and routine, let's build in these times to talk about our mental well-being, our mental health, um, and do these steps and, and lessen the time we're focused on the bad news. What's the virus up to? What's the government saying? Or what's now shut down? Or, so I would be cautious that we limit the intake of the bad news. Don't watch TV 24-7 about what's going on with COVID-19. Plan a family event where for 10 minutes every day we update each other on maybe what we've learned by spending maybe an hour out of an entire day on the updates of COVID. Right? Don't let it occupy your mind because it'll drag you into the mud oh, yeah. if you let it occupy your mind. Yeah. Update each other because everyone listens to a different channel or a mm -hmm. different source or a different social media. Double check your facts. Go to the appropriate government websites and such for the, the correct facts. Mm -hmm. uh, practice all the physical well-being around a pandemic. And then build in time to practice mental health. Mm -hmm. So we've gone step one, self-reflection. And I'm just imagining a family around a dining room table or on their living room couch um, doing this together or a, a, a mom or a dad sitting on the end of the bed of the child as they're going to bed at night saying, all right, let's practice a little bit of mental health. Yeah. So we did our breathing. Well, sorry, we did our self-reflection to how am I feeling? Little feeling, big feeling. Mm -hmm. And allow the feeling to arise, go there with the child. And then we're going to self-regulate this feeling. So we've checked our breathing. And the next thing we do is check our body. Because our bodies naturally get tense around trauma. There's a part of our brain that puts us on high alert. We call it being vigilant. So if there's a grizzly bear in the woods and we're in the woods, we want to know where the grizzly bear is. So we have to be very vigilant. Mm -hmm. This is an invisible grizzly bear we're dealing with. It could reach out of the woods and somehow grab us. So we're vigilant, but we don't know we're vigilant. We're getting boiled slowly in the hot water. Like the frog. Right, like the frog. So we have to say, okay, I have to purposely relax from vigilant into calmness. And there's a whole bunch of ways of relaxing the body. It always starts with the breath, mm -hmm. but we can do muscle stretching. We can do yoga. We can check our posture. Mm -hmm. We can, because um, the posture changes with vigilance. Mm -hmm. um, anything that calms the body. You know, the brain is split into three principal areas of the lower sensory motor brain, the middle emotional brain, and the higher cognitive centers, or if you will, our thinking cap, our thinking brain, the neocortex. Mm -hmm. And the best way to calm the body is to enter in through the bottom of the brain uh, and do some sensory, which is our incoming senses, or motor, which is our outgoing exercise and using our muscles. So think of anything sensory. Sight, sound, taste, texture, touch can calm the body. And some kids will respond to cinnamon or the smell of chocolate or lavender or anything we know from our ch children, because we know our children well, mm -hmm. that we know calms them. Mm -hmm. So any sensory input, the way they're touched, mm -hmm. you know, a hug or sitting close or rubbing the feet or rubbing the hands, anything that we know calms our kids. A light back scratch can calm kids as well as any medicine can calm a child, right? And these are all parents, these are all things that parents innately know, they just forget to practice, Yeah. right? Then the motor are things we've done for thousands of years, like yoga. You know, we, there's all those stretches because the body has some reflexes 
that will calm if we use those reflexes properly. Mm -hmm. So let's do a bit of stretching or family yoga. All you need to know is two or three poses, right? And a lot of parents have done yoga and they all have, I did it 15 years ago. I just need to draw that out of my memory. And the, chi the child pose is a very simple, you can go on Google and learn three simple poses in yoga and do them with the family, right? These are things that we're practicing mental health. So here we are on step two, how to self-regulate. We've done our breathing, we've done our body relaxation. And then the cognitive aspect is, we're gonna think some positive thoughts. And that might come in playing a board game, um, in remembering what we did last vacation, planning on what we're gonna do on this summer's vacation, presuming we can. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, how we're gonna stay in touch with relatives and friends over Skype or things we're allowed to do with good public health distancing. Um, so think about and plan some of the positive things we know still exist in the world. In fact, that we're all home, we're all okay, and we still all love each other. Mm -hmm. Real basic stuff that every family can practice, right? So, and then, the third part, uh, so if I can self-reflect, then I can self-regulate. And if I can self-regulate, calm that feeling down, then I can problem solve how this feeling doesn't keep repeating itself. Oh, yeah. Right? And every family will do that a little differently. That's a little bit what therapy is about. So whatever we've learned from our therapists on the parent side or the child side, bring into play. If you've got books and pamphlets on good mental health practice, bring those strategies into play. A lot of them are simple problem solving. Mm -hmm. And it might be a little feeling like, oh, I'm so bored and frustrated because I'm not going to school now, to great big feelings that maybe trauma brings out. Mm -hmm. You know, those ancient threats that any of, us, any of us might feel. One of the cardinal rules around trauma is if you face one trauma, it opens the closet door I, that's of what basically I every other trauma we've ever experienced. Yes. Yeah. So then we have to be careful, well, hang on, what really am I nervous about right mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. Because it just got fired up because this reminds me of this, which reminds me of that, which reminds me of that. Mm -hmm. And now before you know it, we've down, gone down a garden path of everything that's ever gone wrong in our lives because currently something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. Currently something's out of sorts or out of balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of us have had something go wrong in our lives. And more than we understand, there's been adverse childhood events in lots and lots of kids we don't know about and lots and lots of adults when they were kids that haven't gotten its due, you know, with acknowledgement and help. And so we're fired up in ways we don't even realize, right? Any previous trauma gets fired up. So trauma is like a rut in the road where you've been there once yep. and then you have been there a few times and the ruts get deeper yep. and deeper. Harder to get out of. Harder to get out of. What happens if you're on your own? You're well, self-isolated and, and you don't have family. Well, first of all, stay in touch with whomever you can, long yep. distance or not, uh, because that, that counts as socialization and we are... Yeah social animals after all mm -hmm. and from the physical level through to the soul level we need to connect with other human beings in whichever way we can mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, even emails count mm -hmm. just or snail mail if it ever gets there now but it all counts for s combating social isolation mm -hmm. right but any individual can practice the same mental health that I suggested that parents are doing for kids. They can do for themselves, they can do for their spouses, and we can do for each other, like just alone in a room. But we have to do it. We have to actually practice it, right? We have to prioritize our mental health. We're all busy prioritizing our physical health and well-being and those of others by social distancing, washing our hands, not touching our face, etc. Mm -hmm. So we're all doing that pretty well mm -hmm. and we've in a very lovely way come together around that. Mm -hmm. Good for all of you. Let's practice our mental health in the same way and prioritize it at a time 
of this rapid change when nobody quite knows what's going on. It's changing daily, right? Well, you know, we talked, you and I talked about, you know, sort of there's a bit of the fear of the boogeyman, but there's also real fear. What happens after this? Am I going to be able to find a job? I close my restaurant. Will my restaurant survive? All kinds of real stresses that people are going through that right. cause huge anxiety. Well, it, I think it, it challenges yeah. our faith in yes. our societal structure, like will the government do what they say they're going to do and make sure that no one loses their house or loses their job over COVID-19. Yeah. And for those who don't have a job, well, then it's easier to get on EI. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, the things that we read about in the paper or read about on the government sites, right? We have to have some faith that they will follow through and do what they say they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Just like our kids have to have some faith that the parent will do what they say they're going to do, mm -hmm. right? Take care of us. Take care of us. Right? So we hope that those who take care of us come through for us, right? Um, you're still seeing patients. Yes. Uh, you're still working. Yes. What kinds of things are you seeing with, uh, with the children that you're working with as they go through this? Well, anything from little feelings like I'm so bored out of school yeah. and I can't see my friends to great big feelings like my grandma is in the, you know, the high risk area because she has asthma yes. and she's old and is she going to die? Yeah. And what on earth would I do without my grandma? Wow. It turns out this grandma is an important early attachment figure who looked after this kid when mom and dad were busy working. Yeah. So this child faces the fear of losing really one of their parents. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter the reality of, I mean, I had yesterday in my office someone who was 70 years old, had a fever, called the 811 number and they said, no, we don't test you yet. You're not in our protocol because you, you haven't been around anybody who has been out of the country, which is one of the fundamental questions, right? So then they were nervous, like, what? You're not going to test me? And, but that's also changing daily. The protocol of who we're going to test is changing daily. Hourly. Cause, <laughs> well, because more tests come online and we, mm -hmm. we're getting better at this. So it's like we're all challenged with who knows what and what's coming next and are we all going to get looked after, right? But what we can do as parents is reassure the kids that you're going to get looked after because I'm your mom, I'm your dad, I'm your grandma, and we're going to look after you because we're going to practice mental health together, wow. just like we're practicing physical health together, right? Prioritize it to that level as if it was every other newscast like mm -hmm. COVID-19 is, right? What about uh, within families? I mean, you know, when, when you talked about practices, you talked about families that had to be healthy to a certain extent. What about families that aren't mentally healthy and kids who are in that environment, parents who aren't self-aware, who, you know, are having trouble just dealing with their own stuff, let alone what's happening with their kids, and now they've got kids in their house and yep. maybe the kids are screaming and driving them a little crazy. Um, you know, how do you cope with that, I guess, from a kid's perspective even? Well, if you can't depend on your parent yep. because the parent's not well, yeah. Let's just say that. Yeah. Um, then what we sometimes put kids on is to, because they're really good at this, so they're electronics. And there are a whole series of apps for kids to learn to cope with stress. And even there's new apps for COVID-19 recently out of how to deal with this level of pandemic. Because mm -hmm. this is new to most of us, right? Yeah. Yeah. We went through SARS and H1N1 and whatever, but... Didn't really affect us, though. This is a bit bigger, right? Yeah. This is a bit more complicated. But if we can put kids and teens onto apps where then they can do it themselves. So the app then is kind of their mentor. Hmm. And there's always a really nice, calm voice on an app, hmm. right? And there's apps been up for years and years about just self-reflection, uh, self-relaxation, self-calming, self-soothing, all definitions of attachment. And so we can practice attachment with an app um, uh, at least. That's the least we can do. Wow. You've given us some incredible um, information here, and I know that there's a lot more. But we also want to invite people to send in their questions. Uh, information's at the bottom of the screen, info at casaservices.org. You can email or you can text us at 587 
879-0058, and we would love to hear from you. Um, also up, we have a list of uh, resources um, that people can look to. I don't know if you have any favorite resources that you like to give your clients as well. Um, about uh, you know places that they can go if they you know don't have access to a uh, to a doctor like right. yourself. Well, you mean physical places to go or electronic? Well, to these go? days it has to be virtual. Yeah, so um, I don't have a quick list of you know www dot no, something, no. but all you got to do is Google it basically. Um, Casa Mea on their website have uh, Casa does on yes. their website. Yeah have um, a good list of those things up. So mm -hmm. please do visit our CASA website. Um, the government has some of these websites up. Um, so I, I think there's lots of people doing some really good things to try and keep us informed of where we can go virtually. Yes. Um, and so we hope people do take advantage of it. A trusted source. Um, what about um, uh, sort of other, some of the other coping uh, strategies um, uh, of people who are going through uh, isolation? Let's say you're, you're on your own. What are some of the other strategies that people can do? Well, uh, if you ask, if I were to sit with someone and say, so in the past, yeah. when you've been under stress, what's worked? Yes. Right, because we forget to practice what's worked. <laughs> Right? And it could be as simple as, oh, I used to take hot baths. Well, start with hot baths, right? Or get the heating pad out. Or, um, again, these are all sensory motor things that I talked about before that mm -hmm. are the mm -hmm. bottom of the brain mm -hmm. and really stabilize the core centers of the brain so we can get past panic and into our emotional regulation and into our problem solving thinking brains. Because mm -hmm. that's where we want to be to really deal with this well, right? So just Ask anybody what's worked in the past and make them, ask them to make a little list. And then, so I got six things that I know worked in the past, you know, little things like a hot bath or I call my neighbor or, you know, um, for years I haven't talked to my mom, so I talk to my mom and whatever, right? Just things that we know work for each of us because it's going to be so unique. Right. There are also some huge opportunities in this. I've talked to writers who say, you know, I've had no time yep. uh, to be able to write my book. I can actually go back and start right. writing again. Or, you know, we had to cancel my Woman of Vision event. Yep. And I'm going, okay, we're going to look at this as a celebration going forward. Yes. How can we make it bigger and better? And how can we celebrate human resilience? Yes. And looking at some of those things, finding a new reality mm -hmm. where we're not moving so fast. Exactly. That's why we have time yeah. for attachment. Yeah. We're, we're not too busy for attachment. And I need to stress that attachment is at the core of every other relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like your muscle tone. You might have good muscle tone, but if you improve your muscle tone, every other part of your health gets better. Mm -hmm. So even if you feel you've got fairly good attachment with your kids, if you improve your attachment with your kids through attunement attachment strategies, we've got some of those up on CASA websites, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there are other, resp there are other um, pr uh, res um, um, attachments to other people, their friends, their yes. aunties, their, <laughs> that's only going to get better. Yeah. And they're problem solving with those people. So when they get back to school or when they're with their friends online, that's going to be better, right? Wow. So. Huge opportunities. Yeah, there is. It, there's a lot of silver lining to this if we can get past the panic. So, uh, Dr. Drew, uh, Dr. Drew, <laughs> Denise Milne, yeah. 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 I am, yeah. I am. She loves uh, it. It's a, it's a, it's it's a term of yeah. endearment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, Denise Milne actually is, um, is taking your calls and your texts and your emails. So, so Denise. I have a couple of questions. Yep. Some yep. you've answered, so, um, and I just want you to know the PAC team thanks you so much for the presentation. Uh -huh. But here's a question from Brittany in Parkland School Division. Do you have any suggestions for how teachers can best support families during oh. this time? Oh, good well, question. Um, so if, um, I would imagine that a teacher would imagine herself, himself, in the living room of the child. And what would you do then, right? And I'd get Johnny to, first of all, um, well, so where are we going to work? Like, where's a quiet mm -hmm. spot to work? 
and how, we, how are you going to not be distracted by something else? So really, it's what you're going to say to the parent so that he or she will do the same thing you would do in a classroom, right? And then, as much reassurance as you can about, you know, we're here to learn our math today because I've sent you your math homework on, on, on school zone or online. Um, but do you have any questions for your teacher about what all this means? Because we can maybe do some teaching around how society comes together around a pandemic uh, and then maybe it'll make math easier to learn because we've got the fear out of the way and now we can learn math better. Mm. And I think teachers could do that. It's just simple stuff reminding us how we're coming together with public health strategies, mm -hmm. how we're coming together with mental health strategies mm -hmm. so that we all get through this well together. And so we'll remind them as parents and we'll, now we'll remind them as teachers. Wow. Great. I have another um, question. Is it okay for caregivers to admit they are scared and anxious too to their children or should they pretend they are fine so as not to scare their kids? So, uh, good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would suggest we don't pretend with our kids because they can see through that at, yeah. a, at a mile. So what the parent might do is, so before we're going to talk to our kids, we calm ourselves down. So we practice our own mental health mm -hmm. And then we can go and we can legitimately say, yeah, mom is also very concerned or frightened or sad or scared. Um, but you know what? Here's what mom did to manage that feeling. I practiced the three steps. I reflected about it. Yeah, I am pretty scared. I calm that feeling down through breathing, body relaxation, thinking some positive thoughts. I problem solved it and I came out to take care of you. So here I am. And yeah, I'm scared, but that's what I did about it. So can we do that together now? So that would be how I might suggest a parent manage that. Boy, fear creates its own problems, doesn't it? Yep. It makes it very difficult for us to cope. It affects our, you know, our it, cognitive abilities, it our emotional. It hijacks the brain. It does. So, um, you know, uh, is there anything that we can, I mean, how are we able to, when fear happens to us, we're, we're reacting to it. How are we able to recognize it, see it for what it is, um, and, uh, and learn how to cope with it better? Well, um, just acknowledge that it's there as the beginning, that little bit of self-reflection. Um, a lot of us were raised by parents who would say something like, ah, don't be scared. Yeah. So we trained ourselves not to recognize fear. Now, a pandemic is literally a boogeyman. It's come out of nowhere. Yeah. It's the invisible enemy that comes out of nowhere but can really threaten us, mm -hmm. right? Some in our genes, we remember the plague and all the way back to very ancient times. We're right? reminded constantly with television programs. Right. And so first of all, remind ourselves not to watch too much TV <laughs> about COVID-19 um, yeah. and uh, focus on more positive things. Aren't we um, a bit though, like, the, like if there's a fire, you know, we're attracted to stop and watch people gather. Aren't we a bit sort of, we, we just, when something like this happens, we can't help ourselves. Yeah, no, we're a bit of a deer in the headlights. And yes, I've stopped to, stopped to watch uh, a car accident and how it's getting handled or a forest fire and I drive out to see it because I've never seen it. I mean, we've all done that stuff, right? But somewhere we catch ourselves and we say, okay, enough of watching. Yeah. I need to do now. And I need to do my part in this and for parents it's with your kids and with your spouses and if you're taking care of your mom and dad then with your mom and dad because a lot of us are a sandwich generation of some kind mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but to, to be aware that I'm not gonna let fear which is the granddaddy of all emotions negative emotions hijack my brain I'm gonna be aware of that I'm gonna reflect on it I'm gonna regulate it and uh, so that I can problem solve for myself and my kids. Wow, that's actually a really good way to end. Do you have more questions? Nope, we're good. No, because uh, 
I just checked, and we've been talking for 40 minutes. Oh. Uh, it's been fascinating. It's been fantastic information. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Dr. Drew Bremness for, for joining us today. Um, you can watch. You can let people know. They can watch this online. Um, it's going to be posted as soon as we go off live. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have um, uh, another doctor on, a psychiatrist, I believe, who's going to be talking about more about children from a different angle. And then mm -hmm. Monday, we're going to be talking about it from the parents' perspective. So 3 o'clock, uh, same time, same place. Hope same you'll be channel. able to, <laughs> same <laughs> channel. Hope you'll be able to join us then. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for putting this on. And, uh, and thank you for watching.